Hey everyone, it's Mike Huber, founder and CEO of the Freshman Foundation and certified mental performance consultant. The Freshman Foundation helps young athletes be ready for every next step in the game of life through mental performance coaching. Before we get started with this episode, I'm so excited that the Freshman Foundation digital course is live after months of dedicated design and development and years of rattling around in my head. I'm very proud to have accomplished this goal. In episode 12 of the Freshman Foundation podcast, Vanessa Shannon, the Cincinnati Reds Director of Mental Performance, talks about her experiences serving student athletes while at the University of Louisville. She suggested that incoming student athletes often struggle with going from being a big fish in a small pond to being an average sized fish in a big pond. This course is designed to provide you with the tools to avoid being an average fish when you get to college and being a big fish from day one. My research has led me to teach five key skills in this course, growth mindset, resourcefulness, confidence, resilience, and building a support network. The course is highly interactive. You'll be asked to challenge yourself to reflect, build self-awareness, and practice these core skills both inside and outside of the course. At the end of the course, I expect that you will be ready to attack the jump to collegiate athletics. So, are you in? Visit michaelvhuber.com backslash course to learn more and enroll now. Thank you for listening to the Freshman Foundation Podcast. Welcome to the Freshman Foundation Podcast. Helping you make the jump from high school athletics to the collegiate level and beyond. With your host, Michael Huber. Hey everyone, it's Mike Huber, founder and CEO of the Freshman Foundation. You're listening to the Freshman Foundation podcast, where we help young athletes and their families be ready for every next step in the game of life through mental performance coaching. This is part two of our Ask Me Anything edition of the podcast. Part one dropped two weeks ago. Hope you had a chance to check it out. Let's jump right into part two. Enjoy. Moving on, I, I, the next question I get is, you know, why do I get why do I get so nervous? You know, before a game, in a game, you know, usually before a game is the is what I get. And I think the, the simplest answer I could give you is, it's important, right? Like nerves aren't a bad thing, right? Nerves are 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 our brain and our body telling us that we're about to do something that means a lot to us, right? And so, you know, embracing, trying to make friends with those nerves right? Saying like, Hey, this is really important to me. This is really cool. I'm about to go, I'm, I'm about to get to go, get to go do something. I have an opportunity to go do something I love and do it well, uh, rather than looking at the nerves as a sign that I'm not prepared because that's not, that's not accurate. It may be true sometimes, right? Like, and only, you know, yourself, like if you're underprepared or you're not ready or, you know, you're not in a good place, that does happen and and that's going to happen and part of mental performance coaching i think is being able to help athletes recognize that some days they're not going to have their best going into competition but can they make the most out of what they have available to them at that day but the nerves in and of them, of themselves are not bad right you know sort of one of the visuals that we talk a lot about in in sports psychology is sort of this bell inverted you or bell curve. Right. And so, you know, the top of the bell curve is where our nerves are the highest, but that's where we get peak performance. Um, because we're sort of locked into what, what, what we're about to do. So the nerves are sort of reflective of our ability to have the energy that we need to execute. If our nerves are super low, we might not be, uh, focused or energetic enough to execute on what we're about to do. If the nerves are too high, well, now, you know, we're in a place where we're going to overheat or we're going to, we're going to have, you know, you know, we're going to, we're going to fall apart. So really managing those and identifying it and looking at it as an opportunity and a way for you to go enjoy what you're doing uh, and that it's important and, and acknowledging it and, and being okay with it. You know, not looking at it as a sign of like, I'm not ready or something's wrong with me, uh, which is what I think a lot of people do. Like, why am I so nervous? But you know, the nerves are there for a reason. 
you've got to be able to understand what the reasons are and then ultimately say like, hey, is this serving me? And can I do something different if I'm running too hot, if my nerves are too high, if I'm really have a queasy stomach or I'm really sweating or I'm really like, you know, foggy, well then use your breath, right? Work on using your breath in your pregame, right? To try to get your heart rate down, try to get yourself to calm down, right? If you're too low, you can then, you know, you know, put in some extra warm up or even use your breathing to accelerate your heart rate rate. And I won't get into how to do that, but you can accelerate your heart rate and sort of pick up your energy with your breathing if you do it a different way. So there's a lot of different purposes that nerves serve and they're not all bad. They're actually good if you're able to look at it as such. So one of the things that I get a lot of in working with young athletes is like, I'm not having fun, right? Which is sad to me. Because, you know, I know nowadays sports are much more involved. There's much more effort. There's much more energy. There's much more money. That's all real, right? Like when I was in high school sports or when I was in high school age, we didn't have the same systems and institutions in place that we do today. Super competitive travel sports on the road, on planes, out of state tournaments, uh, social media, recruiting. And, and all those things are good for athletes, right? There's a lot of good to be taken out of that. You get to meet new people and go to new places and you have the opportunity to showcase yourself outside of, you know, sort of your local area and, and get the attention of college coaches. That's all great, right? Like that's the good side of it. The flip side of it is, is that a lot of times it can feel like a job, especially if you're not performing the way you want to perform. Like I'm not, I'm putting in all this time but I'm not performing the the way I want to. Like, why the hell am I doing this? It's not fun. I'm burning out. It's a grind. Like, how do I have more fun? And I think for me, you know, I'll answer that question from the perspective of a mental performance coach. I think first and foremost, it's really thinking about why you play your sport. Like, what's the purpose of you playing the sport? Why do you get out of bed early for a practice or why do you get out of bed early to go to the gym or why do you get up early to go to the airport to get a plane to a tournament and to play five games in a weekend and all these things why do I do it right and everyone's why everyone's purpose for doing is going to be different but if you don't put your finger on why you're doing it and you can't really come up with a good reason then you're probably more likely to be on the road to burn out because like what's the point right like why am I doing this why am I working so hard you know and and to have that essence kind of etched inside of you because that's going to help you sort of endure um, the adversity when your performance isn't where, where you want it to be. And I think ultimately we've gotten to a place where performance is the, the only indicator of success, right? Am I able to produce outward external performance for people to see? Statistics, wins and losses, you know, am I making great plays? Are they getting posted to social media? And if that's the only judge judgment or the only measure of success and you're not getting it, like it's going to be really hard to have fun because it's going to be a constant cycle of judgment. Right. And so having fun to me is, is the word I, I, I think is most appropriate is perspective, Right. I get to play my sport. Most people don't get to do what I do. Most people aren't good enough to do what I do, right? I love I love playing. I may not love the circumstances around it all the time, but I love the game, you know, and this is an opportunity f- to use my sport as a platform for something bigger in life, right? So sort of shifting to a more of a, a growth mindset, the opportunity to, I get to, I'm grateful for, I want to get better. You know, I have the opportunity to grow and, and experience new things versus like, oh, if I don't go out today and I don't perform, then I'm screwed. Or if I don't go out today and I don't perform, you know, I'm not going to get, you know, put myself in a better position to, um, to get a scholarship or whatever it is, or get drafted if that's where you're at in life. Right. So like, I think it's the perspective of it. Right. And like the irony for me and and the irony for me is, and I've had seen this firsthand with clients is the ones who get back to having fun are the ones that actually perform better. 
and whether the performance comes first and the fun comes second or the fun comes first and the performance comes second, I'm not sure, right? It's not, uh, it's, it's not an experiment. It's, it's really hard to judge, but I will say this. I find that most people who are having a good time doing what they're doing are more likely to perform better, right? So like if I can have fun, regardless of whether I'm playing good or bad, I'll probably get into playing good anyway. So why not choose to have a good time, right? Because having fun is a choice, right? I think so much of having fun for most people is fun is based on an external circumstance. Where am I going on vacation? Like this is not even sport related, right? Where am I going on vacation? What am I doing? You know, um, you know, I, fun is a choice. I can have fun anywhere, right? So when I show up at the baseball field or in the soccer field or at the basketball court or wherever on the track, like if I choose to have a good time and enjoy myself and get the most out of it and make the most of my opportunity, I'm probably going to play really good. I'm probably going to perform really well. So, you know, fun is a choice. And I think that, you know, working on making that choice with a mental performance coach is a lot easier because I think when we try to make those choices or, you know, solve those problems on our own, it's really hard to see, you know, that light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. So I think that's a really important one. Um, you know, a lot of people have asked me about resourcefulness because it's a topic in my course and I've been pretty active in promoting the course. And, and a lot of my social media posts have been about the subject of resourcefulness. So, you know, can you explain what that, that means? And so, you know, if you hadn't seen some of the posts or paid attention, you know, resourcefulness is about not only knowing where to look for the help that you need to get better or to solve a problem, but then knowing how to go and get it, right? How to ask someone for help, how to take that information and, and employ it into your life so that things get better. There's help out there for all of us in everything that we do. There's people who we can ask for help, whether it's professionals, whether it's friends or family, um, you know, and then there's technological resources. There's the internet, there's social media, there's Google, right? There's infinite resources at our disposal to get help and get better at things. And a lot of times, you know, we will do that now, but I think our default setting is to do it on our own, meaning we'll go to YouTube or we'll go to the internet or we'll go to Instagram or we'll go to TikTok to get answers. And there's really no guarantee that the information that we're getting is good information, but it's more convenient and I don't have to ask another person for help. I don't have to show them or, or show vulnerability and ask them for help. Right. And I think that there's a limit to the te technical, technological resources that we have at our disposal and that we use to get better. I think one of the most critical skills that any young athlete can learn is how to ask for help, particularly to a trusted adult, a coach, a parent, a teacher, how do I ask for help in a way that is mature, um, that is thoughtful, um, that is self-focused, meaning I'm asking for help from you to help me get better rather than asking for you to do something to better my situation? Because those are two different things, right? Like, you know, I could go ask someone to do something for me without me actually doing anything and I'm asking for a favor versus asking for feedback or asking for an honest assessment or asking to understand like why, you know, why do I stand where I stand? I think that's a big one for young athletes is like my coach made a choice or a decision or is acting a certain way and I don't know why. And that uncertainty is really shaking me, right? I want to understand where I, I, I fit in and, and what's going on. Well, okay, well, can you go talk to your coach? Well, I think so. How am I going to do that? Thinking through and playing out, having that conversation with somebody else, role-playing it, playing out in your mind, writing it down. Like, what do I want to get out of this? What do I want to ask? What do I want to learn? And when, when young athletes do that in the right way, the respectful, mature way, and ask those questions, the feeling that's almost universal that comes back to me as their mental performance coach is they feel relief. Because now I know where I stand. Yeah, you know what? I'm not happy with the answer that I got all the time, but now I know where I'm at. So like, I don't have to worry and be anxious about like what's going on. I know why I'm not playing. I know why coach made that choice. I know why this is happening. Like 
using those resources and not being afraid to advocate for yourself. And don't get me wrong. Asking for help is hard. I've talked about this on other podcasts. I talk about it in the course. I talk about it with my athletes. Asking for help is hard. I mean, I have one whole podcast dedicated to me talking myself like this about why it's hard to ask for help and why I struggled to to ask for help in my life. Because we don't want other people to think that we're not capable or or that we're weak or that we're not uh, competent. All those things, right? Like we'd rather keep it to ourselves and pretend that we're good but that only gets you so far, right? So practicing asking for help, getting better at the skill, knowing when to ask for help. You don't have to ask for people. You don't have to ask for help for everything in every situation all the time, but knowing when something is creating an uneasiness or an anxiety, or you know, you don't have an an, an answer to a problem that's been nagging at you for so long. Like now's the time to think about going to find that answer from another person and getting that relief and comfort and information so that you can go on and be better. So uh, I think it's really important that that's a skill that young athletes develop, work on asking for help and getting better. And I can, and I absolutely always help them to do that in my work. So, um, next question, I want to compete in college. So what do you think I should be working on now? Well, I'll go back to just that last answer. I think you should be working on getting comfortable asking for help, right? Doing it now in high school. You might not need it now in high school, right? Because you're performing above and beyond, because you have a great relationship with your coaches, because, you know, you, you perceive there to be nothing to work on or, you know, you know, or I need to put my time into getting better at the physical act of my sport. But making time to get better at asking for help and challenging yourself and making yourself uncomfortable now before you get to college is going to pay off huge dividends because when you get there, you're going to at least have some practice and going to say like, hey, I don't have a relationship with this person yet or my relationship is still in development, but I can go ask for the help that I need when I need it rather than waiting till it's too late or the last minute or till I'm comfortable. Um, which may never come. So that, that, that's the one thing, right? Like, and, and I, I think, you know, challenging yourself in any capacity, you know, is important. Um, I think, you know, also, you know, making the jump to college, I think is about having research, you know, sort of like preparing for that, learning about what the experience is going to be, having conversations with your coaches and future teammates and, you know, all those things. And so the more information we have, the better, you know, equipped we're going to be. Um, you know, I think finally too, is really thinking about what your goals are for that experience, particularly for that first year, right? What do I want to accomplish in my first year? You know, and I will talk about this with athletes and I think it's really important is like, Hey, what do I want to get out of it? Right. And I'm, you know, most athletes look at their goals in terms of outcomes, right? Like, so for example, in that, in that, you know, um, you know, in that jump to college example, it's either, I want to be a starter as a freshman, which depending on the circumstances that might be really challenging, or I just want to get minutes or I want to get innings or I want to get playing time. Okay. Right. Like, that's great. Like those are important goals to have and you need something to shoot for. But then the question I always ask is how are you going to get there? What are you doing right now that you can control that's going to give you the best chance of reaching that goal, right? There's no guarantee because it's, you know, playing time decisions and all those things are out of your control. Um, and you're coming into a brand new environment, but what can I do right now? That's going to maximize my chances of success. It's not only working on my, my physical game, but it's working on my mental game. Am I doing my meditation daily? You know, am I working on my process goals? Meaning am I working on tracking the things I do every day and getting into good habits and routines now before I get to college, right? Starting to do some of the things that the college coaches are, are going to expect of me when I get on campus, start doing them now rather than waiting, right? Getting ahead of that, um, controlling the controllables, right? Really trying to um, push yourself and challenge yourself in that mental and emotional state, in that capacity, and not just thinking about physical uh, things. So really having a well-balanced um, approach and really putting in the work before you get there rather than just showing up and expecting everything to work out the way you want it to. And I, I hear this a lot from 
former athletes that I've had on my podcast, from people I just talked to in passing, like a lot of people will say, like, you know, the work that you're doing, Mike, is important because I know now after having been in college X number of years ago that like I probably could have used somebody like you because I I thought I knew what was going to come and I had no idea. Right. And so we never have any idea until we get somewhere, right? But are we preparing in the right way? And I think for me, preparing in the right way for the transition to college is also preparing the mental and emotional side as best you can with the information that you have at, at your disposal. So, I, I, you know, what's my favorite part of doing this you know, work? What is my favorite part of mental performance coaching? And I would say that's helping other people. Absolutely 100%. Getting the satisfaction of knowing that the work that I've done with somebody is helping them to to achieve their goals, whether it's a high school athlete who's getting ready to go to college and feels prepared, whether it's a, a college athlete who's getting themselves prepared for a draft um, or, or to go professional. I've had that experience uh, or even working with professional athletes who are trying to, to move up, you know, within their particular sport. And I've had that experience as well. Like, the idea that I'm helping them be better, um, that I'm, I'm giving them the chance to access and unlock a part of themselves, a part of their game that they weren't previously able to do, um, and really giving them the opportunity to be themselves, right? I know from my own experiences in therapy, in other settings where when I was asking for help, one of the greatest benefits for me was, and one of the the greatest gifts was being able to share myself openly without judgment, without condition, right? To truly say what I was thinking and feeling, truly reveal who I am as a person and not feel like that was going to be judged or used in some way, right? And unfortunately, and this I think is just real life, relationships with parents, and I'm a parent, you know, I have my own kids and that relationship is so emotionally invested. It can be, or can feel conditional at times. Right. And that's not something most people like to feel like, Hey, you need to do this to get that. Even if that's not real, that can be the perception between a parent and a child. Right. So if I'm a young athlete, I don't necessarily always want to go to my parents with everything because they're going to try to fix it or they're going to try to change it or they're going to judge it or they're going to do something that makes me uncomfortable. So I'm not, I'm just going to keep it to myself. Or if I'm having a struggle mentally or emotionally or in life, do I trust my coach enough to not use that against me? Like, is he going to think twice about playing me? Is he going to hold me out? You know, how is he going to view that? A lot of athletes don't want to come forward with that. So for me, serving in that role as sort of the objective third party, the the confidant, the mentor, um, you know, the anonymous sort of, you know, black box, uh, I really like that because then I feel like the people that I'm working with are able to be themselves. And I had that experience and I know how just moving and important it is. And so like being that guy is is really a privilege and I'm, I'm grateful to have that opportunity. So uh, I guess in closing, wrap it up. I mean, I think, you know, ultimately I talk about this in my, in the course, you know, you know, in the beginning of the course, uh, the freshman foundation, you know, like sports, it's just a whole cold, hard fact that sports are about results. Right. And, and people want to know like, okay, so what's the result I'm going to get from working with a mental performance coach like Mike, you know, what am I going to get from doing this? And I think, you know, ultimately the results are one con, you know, a greater consciousness and awareness of what I'm thinking and feeling and what I need to do to get better. Right. And so t- again, for me, that, that starts right there because if I understand what I'm thinking and I understand what I'm feeling and I understand what I'm doing and I feel in control of that. Now I have a, I have a choice to respond in the moment when I need it versus reacting emotionally. Like so many athletes, something bad happens to them, right? A bad call, a bad play, and they react to it emotionally. They get angry, they get upset, they get bent out of shape, and it really, really drags their performance down, right? So building that awareness, building that consciousness, building that, you know, choice, giving them the choice to respond absolutely uh, is probably the greatest result I can give an athlete because the outcomes that we see on the field are uncertain. We don't control outcomes. We only control what we put in. 
we don't really control what comes out, where a ball goes, uh, where a shot goes, where a, you know, a, a batted ball goes, where a pitch goes. Once it leaves our hand or once it leaves a bat or once it leaves a racket or whatever, once the gun goes off, like we can push ourselves as hard as we can, but like the ultimate result is really not in our control. So like feeling in control of the things you can control is going to give you the, the, the comfort and, and the confidence that you're the master, right? And you're not subject to the whims of outcomes, which gives people a peace and sort of an easiness inside of them, which helps them to relax, which helps them to perform better, which gives them perspective. It helps them to be able to sort of block out distractions like the people in the stands, like the coach on the sideline, having a mental process and approach that you command and control for yourself gives athletes the ability to go and, and, and own their experience in a more meaningful way. That's the greatest result I could give. Will it make your performance better? I can't guarantee that, right? Will you get a college scholarship? I can't guarantee that. Will you make it to the pros? I can't guarantee you that. Because ultimately, the mental part is only a part. The mental part is only a part, and frankly, it's a smaller part than the physical part. Without the ability, without the skills, without the the physical prowess and execution and work, right? You can have the best mental game in the world, but if you don't have the ability, you know, you're probably not going to get to the places some other people are going to get. So let's be honest about that. But having the mental game is about being able to get the most out of what you do, what your potential is, what your performance is. And like the return on the investment for that is huge. And the result spills over into your real life, right? One of the biggest differences is if you go to a strength coach or you go to a, a technique coach or you go and get instruction, like that applies in your sport, but you, you can't, you can't take, you know, your deadlift to your job. Or you can you take you can't take your deadlift to the classroom, but in mental performance coaching, you could take your reset routine to to a test. You could take your reset routine to an argument that you have with a loved one. You could take your you know your your mindfulness to you know um, you know something you're 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 doing at work, a project, right? My mental skills apply in all these different settings, and so not only are you getting the return as a competitor in your sport, but you're taking it to other areas of your life as you move through different gates. Um, and so the value of that is, is really great. You know, it's more than just a one dimension. So, you know, I believe in it. I wouldn't be in sports psychology. I wouldn't have chose this career after having a successful career if I didn't believe in the work that I do. Um, and I really, want to be a part of that for young athletes because I feel like that's where I add the greatest value just reflecting on my own personal experiences when I was 18 years old or 17 years old and the way I felt about myself and the way I looked at my sport um you know my mind was a detractor from what I was ultimately able to do from a performance standpoint and I don't regret that now but I want to be able to be that person to help someone avoid the way that I felt and having those, you know, pitfalls when I was a younger athlete. So, um, that's it for the podcast. I, uh, I loved answering these questions. I always love talking about my experiences and, and my expertise and, and sharing it with, uh, the audience. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, if you like it, you know, go on Apple, Spotify, leave a review, five star, um, rating, uh, drop a comment, uh, follow us on YouTube, all those things. And so uh, look forward to seeing you back for the next episode. Thanks so much. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to part two of the Ask Me Anything edition of the Freshman Foundation podcast. Hope you enjoyed it and found it valuable. We look forward to having you back in two weeks for episode 68. Mike Huber is the founder and owner of Follow the Ball Coaching, located in Fairhaven, New Jersey. He is a mental performance coach and business advisor dedicated to serving athletes just like you reach their full potential on and off the court. The Freshman Foundation is all about helping you get to the next level. 
For more information, follow along on Instagram at The Freshman Foundation. Please subscribe. Give us a like on iTunes, Spotify. Leave a review. Tell a friend. Most importantly, come back in two weeks. Ready to get better.